Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, <coughs> and I want to welcome all of those who are watching online. For those of you who are here in person, we request that you turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate for the next hour and refrain from texting. <coughs> I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Gazette Newspapers and the Courtyard Marriott Downtown that make this lecture series possible. Tonight, we're going to hear from Dr. Jessica Whited. She's an assistant professor at Harvard University, grew up initially in Michigan, then moved to Missouri. She got a Bachelor's of Arts degree in philosophy and a Bachelor of Science degree in zoology from the University of Missouri, and uh, she has her PhD from MIT. <clears throat> and when her work for her PhD at MIT was dealt with fruit flies, and um, now she, she is studying salamanders and how salamanders are able to regenerate their, their limbs. She um, ha has a, a new laboratory on the main campus at Harvard University, and they're trying to figure out whether, what the implications are for human beings to be able to regenerate limbs at some time in the future. There are about two million people today who've lost a limb in the United States, and it's projected that that number will increase to about three million before long. Jessica is the recipient of the NIH, that's the National Institutes for Health New Innovator Award, the March of Dimes Basil O'Connor Award, and the Smith Family Foundation Excellence in Biomedical Research Award. She already has a distinguished record of publications, and she's going to tell us all about the salamanders, how they function, and what the implications might be for human beings at some time in the future. Please join me in, je in welcoming Dr. Jessica Whited. Thank you, Jerry, for that awesome introduction. And thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, as a scientist, I feel that one of my most important jobs is to talk to the public about what we do um, in the lab. And I'm really excited to be here. Today, I want to tell you about um, this animal. So this is Sally. Uh, she is an example of an axolotl. And these are my favorite animals in the world. And today, I'm going to tell you about what I think is so amazing about axolotls and what we can learn from them that may one day be important for human beings. Um, what I would like to convince you of is that these axolotls, which can regenerate limbs throughout their entire lives, will provide humans uh, with the instruction manual for how limb regeneration can occur. And when we think about an instruction manual, I just wanted to bring to your mind uh, what you would expect to see in an instruction manual by thinking about these IKEA furniture directions. And so the things that you need are you need to have a handle on the tools that are going to be required. Uh, for the process to happen. So these might be um, the kinds of tools that the animal's body has available uh, to execute the kinds of um, you know, steps that are required. Of course, you also want to think about the parts. So in this case, we're thinking about the cells, the genes, the proteins, et cetera, that are going to be used to make the new limb. And all of this has to happen in the right environment. So if the environment isn't right, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the factors that control that, then the whole process um, could go wildly wrong, as shown here. And the same is true in the limb. And then finally, of course, it's really important to understand the instructions. So these are the steps about what has to happen um, and when. So you know, there is an order to the whole process, and it starts with a very stereotypical series of events, and then it, it sort of marches in progression. And you can't get to the later parts until you execute the early parts. And so together, if we understand all of these things about how limbs can be regrown, then we can think about how the salamander regrows this entire limb, as shown here, and what that could mean for human beings. So the first salamander that I showed you is an example of a wild-type axolotl, and that just means the kind of axolotl that you might find in nature if you could find one today. They are critically endangered, and in their native habitat, it, they might actually be near extinction or extinct. 
Um, and while there are conservation efforts underway in Mexico um, to try to save the axolotl, in the meantime, the ones that live in the lab are largely the white ones that I'm about to show you. Um, and these guys have been bred in captivity for about 150 years. And we typically use the white ones to study because they're easier to see through, uh, as shown here. Um, so here you see an example of an axolotl. They can be quite large. They're permanently aquatic. They grow about 10 centimeters long, and they can live a very long time. And the important thing to look at here is this limb, so as shown in this forelimb here, which if you look inside of it and you stain this limb with um, some dyes that will stain the cartilage blue and, and the bone red, you can see a couple of things. One is that they have a similar kind of bone structure to the human limb, um, and that we know that these uh, develop and regenerate, similar to how human beings lay down their skeleton. And just for reference, we can also appreciate that the human and the axolotl limb is, are actually quite similar in their morphologies as well. And so what I'm not showing you here is that inside these axolotl limbs, you will find all the other tissues that human limbs also have, like, for instance, muscle, tendon, connective tissue, nerves, blood vessels, skin, exa for example. And so we think that if we understand how the axolotl regenerates its limbs, that these will be some really important clues uh, for approaching the question in the future in the human being. On the next slide, we see an axolotl from our colony um, that was filmed over the course of eight weeks following an amputation event, which is not shown here. And what I want you to see from this are a couple of things, and I'll point them out um, as the movie progresses. So this animal is going to have an amputation of a forelimb, and you'll see right here that this little bump forms. And the little bump is really important. It's called the blastema, and this is sort of where all the magic happens. All of the progenitor cells, so these are the cells that are going to give rise to the internal cells of the new limb, they accumulate in this blastema, which grows and eventually takes on the shape of the new limb as shown here. And when this process is done, you truly cannot tell the difference between the limb that was amputated and the one that was uh, never touched. It is that perfect. The other thing to look at is that when it's over, you really cannot see any scarring whatsoever on the outside of the animal. And this is important because it strikes at this um, sort of relationship this antagonistic relationship between scarring and regeneration. So these animals, as with other animals that are master regenerators, they do not spontaneously scar following injuries. So you can cut them, and they'll heal the wound scar-free. And we know that even though mammals do this in utero, um, including humans and mice, um, that they lose this ability as they mature. And we know that this is also connected to their, the salamander's ability to regenerate. So what does this look like um, when we think about the issue of how much to regenerate. And this is actually really important for medicine because as you can imagine, if a human being needs to grow back just a hand, it would be counterproductive to grow an entire arm. Um, and if the human being needs to grow um, an entire arm, it would not be great to grow just a hand. Well, the salamander has figured this out. So shown on this slide, which is a very famous slide from 1969, um, are two newts. So these are a different kind of salamander, but the same principles hold true in the axolotl. And what we can see here is that um, these two newt forelimbs received two different kinds of amputations. The ones on the left got what's referred to as a distal amputation, and the ones on the right got a proximal amputation. And what do I mean by that? So in embryology and in um, biology in general, when we think about patterning the embryo or patterning a structure um, on the animal, uh, when we think about appendages, proximal is, um, in the case of the arm, close to the armpit, and distal is close to the fingertips. And for the animals that received the distal amputation, basically just the hand was removed, and you can see that only the hand grows back. Meanwhile, if you give an animal a proximal amputation and you remove essentially the entire arm, then the entire arm will grow back. Um, this takes about the same amount of time. In reality, a lot of times this one will take a little bit longer, but the really important thing here is that the animal doesn't need instructions on how much to grow back, because it knows how to do that. And we need to understand this as well if we're going to really harness this kind of um, technology for regenerative medicine. OK, so how long have scientists been studying limb regeneration in salamanders? If we take a step back and sort of ask this question, um, the answer is that they've known about this since the time of George Washington. And so this really puts it at about 250 years ago that it was first described in the scientific literature um, by this guy here, an Italian guy who was a, um, a scientist, and his name is uh, Lazzaro Spallanzani. And at that time, it was appreciated that uh, this, this happens, but the details about how it happens were uh, very opaque. And so we've known about it for 250 years. 
but it's been a very hard question to crack at sort of the molecular and cellular level. Meanwhile, modern molecular biology has really grown by leaps and bounds, um, while this old question that has fascinated a lot of people has remained unanswered. In fact, actually, we know a great deal, not everything, but a great deal about how animals grow limbs in the first place, so how those limbs develop. And those kinds of insights into how limbs develop were completely enabled by tools that, were, that let scientists get in there and sort of muck with different genes and different kinds of proteins in different cells and then take, take the process apart and understand how limbs develop. Um, and the animals that were best used for understanding how limbs develop were, have been chickens and mice. Um, meanwhile, the same tools uh, were not operational in salamanders. And so this question has remained for a very long time. But what I'd like to convince you of tonight is that now is the perfect time to be working on salamander limb regeneration because finally, in just the last 10 or 15 years, all of the kinds of tools that we would need to answer these questions have now been proven operational and developed um, specifically, um, you know, innovated in particular ways for salamanders. And so what kinds of tools do we now have? So some of them are illustrated here, and I'm just going to go from the left to the right uh, in describing what is shown in these cartoons. So first, we have an example of something called transgenesis. And so this is simply inserting a new piece of DNA, and in this case, into the salamander genome. And so what might you do with this? So one of the things that this has been most useful for is tracking cells around and to see what happens to them. And so a very common thing that you can do now is to take a tiny piece of DNA that was you know, first discovered in the jellyfish that makes a protein that is fluorescent. And you can insert that into a salamander cell and then make it fluoresce green. And you can see what happens to it during the process of regeneration, for example. You can also put a different kind of DNA in, like a, uh, the gene of something that you care about, that you're interested in, and see what happens when you give the salamander too much of that gene. And you sort of make predictions, um, testable hypotheses about its role in regeneration, and test them using transgenesis. And this technology has actually elaborated quite a bit, and so now we can also express things in particular cells. So, in the first iteration, it's all the cells in the body, and now we can you know, target particular cells, so we have more precision. The second um, example here is something called editing. So gene editing has been very much in the news lately. The people in the audience have probably heard about something called CRISPR, which is a technology that can allow you to go in and precisely modify a particular gene in, in even a person, and this was recently reported um, in these two twins in China, twin babies. And so this is a technology that's really revolutionizing these otherwise non-model organisms, including salamanders. And so we can go and we can say, okay, here's this gene, we think it is important for regeneration, but how can we prove it? And the way to prove it is to remove it or take away its function and say what happens to the process of limb regeneration. If it's screwed up, then you can go in and figure out a little bit more, how is it screwed up, and then basically you can infer what that gene is normally doing during normal limb regeneration in this way. Thirdly is a technique um, that we can also use to deliver these kinds of um, genetic elements, and this is a viral strategy. And so in this instance, what happens is the virus that I'm talking about, we're not trying to make the animal sick. We're trying to use the virus as what's called a vector, and this will allow the virus to bring foreign DNA pieces into the cells and to basically um, you know, lead to their expression. And so this is a great way to permanently tag things because the, whatever you encode in the viral genome gets integrated into the salamander genome, and this will help you, again, go on to um, figure out what cells are doing or what genes are doing. And then finally, we can do localized genome editing. And so in the first example, this would be, oh, you're missing the gene. The salamander is missing the gene from all the cells. But you can imagine that um, that's not very precise. And you can also imagine that a gene might be important for developing the animal in the first place, but it might also have another role during limb regeneration. And if you get rid of it, then the animal doesn't develop. And so you won't have the opportunity to examine the question of its role in limb regeneration. There are several ways around this, but one of them is to just simply um, locally edit or remove the gene from the limb and then go ahead and see what happens. And so we're using all of these techniques now in the lab. And additionally, in the last just a couple of years, really, We've had all these genomic resources become available. And so this is work done not just by my group, but from many other groups as well. And you can see here um, three examples. So first are something that in science we call transcriptomes. And this really just means what genes are on and off, where and when. So you might get a very good idea about what might be the important genes by just asking who is turned on, you know, for instance, in that little bump that I showed you earlier in the regenerating limb. The second thing is that 
recently, just last year, the full genome sequence was published for the axolotl salamander. This was a, a really hard uh, project to do, the people who did it, um, because it turns out the axolotl has a genome that's 10 times bigger than the human genome. And additionally, it has a lot of repetitive sequences, which just makes it actually um, very difficult to piece together. And so with this tool, now we can do studies that we hadn't dreamed of before, um, and we have the genetic uh, resource to go ahead and, and, and do those. And then thirdly, there's recently been a chromosome map, and so this is sort of like you can imagine taking the information um, that's all tangled up in here, just the big string of uh, the base pairs in the DNA, but assigning them to the chromosomes. They have 14 chromosomes, and so they're diploids, so that would be 28 um, together, so 14 pairs. And having this physical map will also enable the kind of studies that will tell you things about when the genes are on and off, but like what are the other nearby genetic elements that control them being on and off. So you need to know something about the neighborhood in order to ask those really important questions. And this could be important for um, biomedicine because it could turn out that salamanders turn genes on after amputation, that humans might also have those genes, but they're not able to turn them on, for example, in a very simplistic example. Okay, so these, this is our toolkit now to understand this process. And what are the essential components of limb regeneration? So I'm going to go on and tell you what some of the most obvious features are of limb regeneration, and then we're going to dig in a little bit to each one of these steps and, and ask, you know, what, um, for instance, what are the parts that are required? So after amputation, it's actually quite amazing that the salamanders, um, you know, there's not a lot of bleeding, and, and sometimes there's none. And, and what you can see is that uh, the, the wound just seals itself up, and within a few hours, this really special kind of skin forms. And this we refer to as the wound epidermis. And we know this is absolutely critical for regeneration. In a second, I will tell you why we know that. The next thing that happens is that little bump forms that we saw from the video. And the little bump has a special name. It's called a blastema. And you'll notice that it has a really um, peculiar location also, and that's the tip of the stump, as shown here, but immediately underneath the wound epidermis. And this was appreciated very early on in the field. And so um, it was concluded that there are probably signals coming, molecular signals coming from the wound epidermis instructing the blastema, but now we also know that it's probably happening in the opposite direction as well um, between these two tissues. So shown in gray are, is the newly regenerated limb, so all of the gray is the new tissue. And there's some super important questions down here. So for example, scaling. If a baby salamander loses its arm, it's about the thickness of a toothpick. Whereas if an adult salamander loses its arm, it's about the thickness of my pinky. And the adult salamander will grow back the big arm, and the baby salamander will grow back a little arm. So not only does this proximal distal amount uh, preserved in the regenerated limb, but also you know, just the gross size or the scale is preserved. And we really know hardly anything about how that information is encoded. So there's some really important questions out here, also questions of connectivity, so blood vessels and nerves. Um, and, I, and I think these are really important to understand, especially if we're going to someday hope to stimulate regeneration in human beings. But my lab largely focuses on the early parts, and that's um, because you need a blastema to regenerate, and humans don't normally mount this response. So what we feel is if we understood the process of going from here to here and what's really happening inside here, We'd be a major part of the way towards understanding how um, it could someday possibly be stimulated or augmented in human beings. And so our energy is mostly focused in, in this area. So if we think about making a blastema, um, what would be the parts list for a blastema? And what I'm about to show you is not exhaustive of the parts list, and it really is um, sort of informed by our current understanding, which could change. And what is shown here is that um, we have something that I like to call a nascent blastema here. So this is just like the beginnings of the blastema. And what features are in the beginnings of the blastema? Here we see the wound epidermis in magenta right here. And then we see these little um, cells that I've illustrated, sort of like star-shaped cells. And we know that these are um, cells that are told to, to synthesize DNA in anticipation of re-entering the cell cycle and proliferating. And that's what that's what um, basically defines them as being activated. So they, they've received some signals, largely these are unidentified, that stimulates them um, to awaken from a state of um, what we call quiescence, which is just sort of sitting there, um, and tell them to go ahead and start preparing to divide. But not only that, they also receive signals that tell them where to go. And they accumulate underneath this wound epidermis along with some blood cells. And when I say blood cells, I don't mean Oh, they're a little cut off. I don't mean just um, red blood cells, but also white blood cells will go here. 
um, so immune cells. And they all gather together and they grow blastema. And here you can see as they proliferate, as the blastema cells proliferate, the bump gets bigger. There's some other features that I want us to look at, and one of them are these black things. And so these are nerves, which we'll talk about in a second as being uh, super important for this process. OK, so how do we know that the wound epidermis is important to make this happen? The most um, compelling argument for this is an experiment in which the wound epidermis is prevented from forming. And the way that that happens is that after, immediately after amputation, the researcher basically takes the, the full skin, so this is uh, the skin that's not wound epidermis, and sutures it across the cut stump. And if you do that operation, then it prevents the true um, wound epidermis from forming. And therefore, it probably might also prevent most of the kinds of changes in gene expression um, that drive the function of the wound epidermis. And when this happens, what you see is that regeneration fails. And in fact, you actually don't see the outward growth of a blastema. And so for a long time, this kind of experiment um, indicated to people that, oh, the wound epidermis is the thing stimulating the activation of those internal cells. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, whether that's true or not. But because you don't see a blastema, it was um, considered possible that inside here, most of the events weren't happening. And I think we can refine that hypothesis a little bit based on um, new data. But another thing that is important to think about here is the human condition. So it's not as if humans can't regenerate any parts of their limb. Um, it turns out that human beings can regenerate the very distal aspects of their fingertips. So basically after the last uh, joint. If you lose a fingertip after the last joint, and especially if you are young, you can spontaneously replace it. But only if nobody sutures. Uh, the sutures that wound close. If the wound is sutured close, even in a child, then nothing happens. There is no digit regeneration. But if it's left open and, you know, like a gauze and a, an antibiotic is applied, then the human can regenerate the digit tip also. And so this is a really interesting question, and mice also regenerate their digit tips. How similar that process is to salamander limb regeneration at the molecular level, we don't yet know, but certainly um, they both require the wound epidermis. Okay, so. One question we are interested in at tackling in my lab is, does the wound epidermis tell the inside cells to activate? And to approach this question, what we did was this experiment here. Um, and this was a bit of a serendipitous finding, actually. So you can see here that this animal has um, two amputations and uh, two regenerating limbs on the left side. But what we, what we found was actually that um, the right-hand limb is not a uh, passive bystander in this process. In fact, what happens on the right-hand side is that cells are copying DNA in anticipation of dividing, and these are all the pink cells shown here. All the nuclei are stained blue, and the ones that have become activated are stained in pink. And if we map this with respect to time, you can see that very, very few um, cells would be pink over here in an animal that had uh, no amputations whatsoever, so maybe 2%. However, in response to an amputation elsewhere on the body, these cells inside these limbs actually um, are significantly more likely to be copying DNA in anticipation of dividing, as shown here. And if we take this graph out, by the time the limb has regenerated fully, then it goes back to baseline. And so we're really interested in learning more about this. But what I think is important about it for the time being is that it really shows that the initial activation is a systemic event. It happens throughout the body. In fact, actually, we were surprised to find that this, this event happens not just in what we call the contralateral limbs or the bystander limbs, but also in the heart, the liver, and the spinal cord. And so it's possible that lurking inside each one of these organs, and all of those things um, regenerate in the salamander, are these resident progenitor cells that are just sort of waiting for a cue to start becoming activated. Um, intriguingly, we found that if we block the formation of the wound epidermis, that this contralateral response still occurs. And so this tells us that the wound epidermis is dispensable for the systemic response. And, and I'm going to talk about that on the next slide, like what I think that means um, for the process in general. Now, we're still in the process of finding the signals that cause body, this body-wide response. The most um, parsimonious hypothesis is that probably the signal is traveling through the bloodstream, but we haven't proven that yet. Uh, if it does travel through the bloodstream, we would like to know the identity of it. And once we do the identity of it, you should be able to stimulate this response in an uninjured animal. And so we're working on all of those things right now. But what do these experiments tell us about the early instructions? So what we think this means is that, and here I'm just showing you the other limb. Well, this could also be many of those other tissues we talked about. 
Following amputation of one limb, cells become activated throughout the body. And this does not require the wound epidermis. A blastema grows, but it only grows on the side at the site of the injury. And we think that this is telling us that um, the initial response is linked to the injury per se, and that the accumulation or the persistence of the, of, uh, the proliferation effect is only happening at the site of injury, not elsewhere. Um, because eventually this, this will, one will grow, while meanwhile um, it will become extinguished on the other side. And it will become extinguished here also after it's done. And so we think that this means the role of the wound epidermis is not to tell the cells to activate, but instead to tell them uh, to continue dividing and where to go. And the reason why I think this is possibly important for medicine is because it turns out that mice have a similar injury response, but obviously they don't regrow entire limbs. And people do know um, from some beautiful work um, done in the lab of Tom Rando over here in California, they do actually know what the signals are in the mouse that controls the systemic response. It turns out that so far in the salamander, those are not likely to be um, the signals that control the response in the salamander. However, this injury response is conserved, and we don't know in people if it will be, but we suspect that it would be similar to the mouse. And so what I think this means is that it could be that all along, um, that humans and all animals have this uh, activation effect. And maybe they even have the right cells and the right parts if in the part list we were talking about after amputation, but they don't have the instructions. And the instructions might be to make the right kind of wound epidermis. And without this part, they can't sustain a localized regeneration response at the site of injury. If this turns out to be true, then um, our goal in regenerative medicine would actually um, be different than it might be postulated to be otherwise. So maybe it's the case that in the human amputee, immediately following the amputation, the first steps do happen, but they don't have the appropriate environment or the appropriate wound epidermis, and that this part is required for the instructions to keep these cells um, proliferative and tell them where to go. And so we're interested in um, taking this project further. But one question that I want to move on to is what are the other parts required to build a new limb? And so some of this other work that I'm going to talk about is work from other labs, very nice work from other labs that really, um, you know, elegantly gets at this question. Um, so I told you earlier that blood cells get inside the blastema and that they're at the site of injury. And some of these blood cells are white blood cells, so those are blood cells from the immune system. And what has been done in the immune system is to basically use this technique for depleting macrophages. All you really need to know about macrophages is that they're a kind of cell that can normally eat um, invaders or eat cells of, you know, from the organism themselves that need to be um, cleared during development or during um, some kind of injury response. And so what you see here is that if you deplete those macrophages, the next thing that happens, like let's say you poison all the macrophages and then you give the animal an amputation, what happens? Limb regeneration is blocked. So this experiment tells us that macrophages are required for limb regeneration. And in fact, you actually don't even see a blastema. And so that also tells us that they're required early in the response um, following the amputation. And if you look inside these limbs, um, and this work was done um, by James Godwin in the lab of Nadia Rosenthal. So you get inside these limbs, and what they saw was that, intriguingly, this one grows a blastema, as shown here, and it has this architecture. So this is like a, t a stained tissue section. So basically, you take um, you know, the, the stumps of these animals, and then you um, freeze them and preserve them, and you cut very, very thin tissue sections, and you transfer them to slides, and then you stain them with um, different kinds of chemicals in this case that will, um, in this case, stain, for instance, the collagen hot pink. And a normally regenerating limb has this beautiful collagen architecture, so it's a very thick band on the stump, but the blastema doesn't have this thick band here. However, in the ones that have been, where the macrophages have been poisoned and there are no macrophages, you see this really thick band here. And this actually is indicative of scarring. And so these animals don't regenerate and they do scar. So this goes back to that link between regeneration and scarring that I talked about earlier. What's really cool about this is that if you give this animal time, it will replenish the macrophage lineage because like a lot of blood cell types, they're constantly replenished um, in the animal's circulation, for instance. And if you do that, and um, in this exact same animal, you let the animal make more macrophages, what do you think happens if you give it an amputation? You can amputate that exact same limb, and that limb will undergo successful regeneration, which I think is also um, very cool. So this is telling us that part of the um, secret sauce or like the mix or the instruction manual for regrowing limbs is going to have something to do with modulating the immune system. Um, and people really ought to be also looking at, you know, what's happening in the human condition um, for some clues there. 
what else is required besides immune cells? This is an experiment that was done now very close to 200 years ago. So um, an experiment in which the investigator removed the axon. So I just want to take a step back here. These are nerves shown here. And they have a similar architecture to the nerves that service the human arm. Um, and the cell bodies live you know, close to the spine in the animal and in the human. So those are the, that's where the nucleus lives. And that's where it gets sort of a round part of the cell. And they send out these axons into the limb. And those axons, um, there's different kinds of them. But you know, for instance, they interface with the muscles. And they're the things that allow you to um, move your arm. If you denervate these limbs, meaning you take out pieces of the axon, so basically make it so that the limb doesn't have any nerves, but the cell bodies still live there, which we'll get to in a second, and you basically make a denervated limb, shown here, and then you amputate that denervated limb, what happens? You can grow a tiny blastema, but it doesn't get any bigger. And so what this tells us is that nerves are required, not for making the blastema in the first place, but for growing it. And we now know that actually the nerves are secreting some factors that act um, to tell the cells to proliferate more. And in a hyper-regenerative animal like a salamander, they're very good at regrowing their axons. And so if you give this situation more time, what will happen is that those cell bodies which are still there will grow axons into the stump. And then if you um, re-amputate that limb, then you'll see the same thing as with the macrophages, is that they will undergo successful regeneration. And so this is probably telling us that in order to get human limbs to regenerate, we have to have them have a sufficient nerve supply to do so. And so we really probably need to look at um, you know, what is the nerve supply, and does it need to be augmented, and if so, how? In the salamander, though, it's really interesting because two different people have found two different molecules that can um, take, the function, take the place of the nerve in this equation. And how did they do this? So basically shown here is the original operation is the same. You remove the nerves from the salamander limb. And we know that this is normally going to grow a mini blastema that fails to grow any bigger. However, in this context, if you give either one of these proteins, and so far only two have been identified, but it's possible there are many others, um, these are just their names, anterior gradient protein and neuregulin, then you can rescue the regeneration of that limb um, in the absence of nerves. And so these are some possibly important clues, and there could be more clues about the kinds of factors you might give a human if indeed uh, lack of nerves is one of, uh, of uh, sort of the bottlenecks in getting them to regenerate. And after this was first observed, you know, the phenomenon of, of requiring nerves, it has also been understood since then that there is actually a correlation between the amount of innervation a species has in the limb and the propensity of that whole species to be able to regenerate the limb. Uh, this is shown here in this graph. This graph is um, quite old. It's from the 1960s. Um, but it's still sort of the best example of, of uh, mapping this. And here we can see this is a kind of salamander that's very good at regenerating limbs throughout life. And it has a lot of nerve fibers um, you know, per, in this case, probably the um, surface area of the skin. So they want to normalize it to something. And so this one has a lot of nerve fibers. And this, this here is uh, a lizard, which um, lizards can regenerate tails, though they do it imperfectly. And then we have a mouse, which you can see it's underneath the threshold required for regeneration. And then you have two different kinds of frogs. Frogs are a super interesting case, because they're also amphibians. But they actually only are really good at regenerating limbs when they're immature. So after they undergo full metamorphosis, they lose the ability to regenerate limbs. And most adult frogs can regenerate just a spike of cartilage with a little bit of skin over it or nothing. And here's an example of a frog that actually I found at my house. And you can see that um, this one was living in the wild. And it had obviously undergone some kind of amputation event. And it doesn't regrow. So along the same lines as noticing that the species that are very good regenerators have a lot of innervation, um, when you look at the frog in the case of the metamorphosis, you can see here that the only time the frog can really regrow a perfect limb is basically when the limb isn't even completely developed yet. You can see here. So here's a limb bud. And then here's one that's like a little bit more mature. By the time you can start to see the digits forming, if you amputate that froglet limb or that tadpole limb, what you get is missing digits. And then eventually in the adult, you either get nothing or you get this spike uh, with only two tissues in it. Some really interesting new data has emerged from one of our collaborator labs in, at Tufts University in Boston. And in this uh, work, what they did was they took frogs that are at this stage of their life. They really regenerate hardly anything, just a spike. And they made this little device, which they call a biodome, which you can load with different kinds of chemicals. And you, it's like a sleeve that you can place on the animal. And the hope is that someday that something similar could be placed on a human being. And you can control the local environment. So earlier when we saw the IKEA 
instructions, we talked about the environment. And so this is really the idea is manipulating the environment in a way that is more conducive to regeneration. So in these experiments, the animals only wear the biodome for a very short period of time at the beginning, um, closely after amputation. And in the first example of this, this biodome has been filled with a hormone that you all recognize is called progesterone. And what the progesterone um, did was sort of kickstart a regenerative program in this frog. And the first thing that I'll show you here is that it led to more innervation than normally happens. So this is a normal frog leg, and it got the device, but it didn't get that particular hormone, everything but that hormone. And you can see that in this cross section, so they basically took a tissue section of the limb um, in this direction, that this amount of tissue is um, heavily innervated. So, you know, this arrow is not that big, and here we have the cartilage, and then now here we have the skin. So basically, this is what one of those spikes looks like on the inside, and there's not a lot of nerves in there. However, if you give those animals just a little dose of progesterone for just a very short period of time after the amputation, you can get a lot more innervation as shown here. So the nerves are in, in red. And intriguingly, they also took those animals and they let them live for a very long time after this experiment. And they asked, with just like a very transient treatment of progesterone, what happens to the overall process of limb regeneration? And this is shown here. So here I'm just going to show you what the outlines looked like of the limbs that regenerated. And you can see that um, this guy, as predicted, um, he only grew a spike. Whereas many of the examples from the ones that were transiently treated with progesterone grew something that was much more than a spike. And it was much closer to the kind of paddle-shaped, webbed foot that you would actually see um, in a perfect regenerate. It's not perfect, but it's a starting point. And so um, people are going back, and they're adding more ingredients to these um, little biodomes to see if they can um, go ahead and like, transform this even further into what would look like a truly successful regeneration event in that frog. OK, so let's take a step back from the nerves and at, just ask the question, how do we know that once you make a blastema, it has all the tools, parts, and instructions to execute the regeneration event? And I think these are some um, really cool experiments. So what's done here is like we just have an animal. Let's call him the donor animal. Uh, we use him to make a blastema, and it's very easy to just remove this blastema. It's almost like a little biopsy um, event in the lab. And you isolate the blastema. And uh, salamanders are amazing for this kind of work where you can do transplantations because they don't reject tissue from other um, salamanders. And so basically, you can do these kinds of experiments that in many other animals you can only do when they're embryos. Um, so in this experiment, basically, you can take the little blastema, and then you can transplant it to another animal, and you can say, what happens to it? So let's say if we take this blastema and we transplant it here, if this blastema has all the information needed to grow, in this case, the whole limb, then what do you think will happen? So the answer is that you grow a whole limb out the side of the animal. And this is a very clever, simple, and beautiful experiment that really shows that the blastema has all of the instructions and the parts and the tools uh, to, to make that limb. And what's really cool is you can put it in any part of the animal that has some regenerative propensity. So instead, we could put it in the eye. And what you would find is that you can generate a salamander that has a limb growing out of its eye. Um, what I didn't show you here is that we also know that this blastema, um, you might inf infer this from the fact that I drew the whole limb here, but this blastema also knows where it came from um, with respect to the proximal distal axis. So here I drew a proximal amputation, and so it's coded to grow an entire limb, um, and which is shown here. And this was really hammered home by these experiments that were done in the 1980s. And in these experiments, basically, they prepared both proximal and distal blastemas. And then they did the transplantations and asked what happened. And this is so cool, because here you have um, a proximal amputation, which I've highlighted the blastema in green here. I've colored it green. And if you take a donor that had the same kind of amputation event, so a proximal amputation, and you sort of just stick this on the side. You graft it on the side. It'll stick there, right? And then you give it, let's say, 10 weeks to regenerate. Uh, the the um, recipient limb grows back, as expected, shown here. And then the donor blastema, it grows an entire limb, which is interesting, because that's what it was fated to grow. And it does it up here um, towards the armpit, so like where it would normally grow out. Meanwhile, if you take that same kind of recipient, as shown here, but you graft a distal blastema onto the side of it, as shown here, then you get this result, which is really just illustrates that all the information was inside here to make only a hand, because only a hand forms. And intriguingly, it only forms like where the hand goes. And so there's so much work yet to be done to understand how this happens. We'll touch on that at the end. The most famous example 
of a molecule that can control this is this molecule called retinoic acid. And we won't get into exactly um, what it does, and some of that is still being debated. But in this beautiful experiment by Malcolm Baden in 1983, he showed that you can take these distal amputations, which should only grow a hand. But if you expose these animals to retinoic acid, put it in the water, or you inject it into their bodies, then instead of growing just a hand, they grow the entire limb back. And that's super cool because it says that basically that chemical alone is enough to re-specify that distal blastema and make it grow um, a, prox a, a proximal amount of tissue. So that's very cool. We'll get back to that in a second. OK, so but from a modern standpoint, um, how would you identify the new genes that might be crucial for limb regeneration? I told you all these tools we have now at our disposal, and how have we used them? So one of the things we did in my lab was to just take a very agnostic approach and very simple approach. And that's to say, the blastema is going to be turning on genes that are really important for its function. And some of these genes will be peculiar to blastemas. And so how can we figure out what are the ones that are more or less specific to blastemas? Um, we can first figure out all the genes that are turned on here. And so basically, the way that that works is that um, normally the DNA transcribes mRNA. And you can capture the mRNA. Those are the ones that are highly active. And then you can say, OK, take an inventory of the mRNA molecules. And that will tell you, you know, what are the um, genes that are active in a blastema. But it's not going to tell you which ones are special for the blastema. To do that, you really have to compare that set of mRNA transcripts or that set of genes to many other tissues. And so this is what we did. We compared it to whole limbs, which um, you know secretly have the ability to regenerate limbs, but they're not actively doing it. And then we compared it. We just dissected apart these tissues. And we got all the mRNAs out of the cartilage, all the mRNAs out of the bone, the muscle, the blood vessels, and many other tissues. And we were able to make all of these pairwise comparisons. And this really allowed us to elucidate what are the genes that are specific to blastemas. And then we can take those clues and consider those candidate genes to go on and do these more refined studies using these kinds of editing techniques. So this is what we found. Plotted here um, on the right are, uh, and, the, and the rows are the genes. So there's about 150 genes. Um, and the columns are the different tissues. And all I want you to appreciate here is that um, we have about 150 genes that are very highly expressed. So those show up in red. So this is um, very highly expressed as red and very lowly expressed as green. And these are the ones that are very specific to blastemas compared to everything else, including the unamputated limbs. And so this gives us some real clues where we can dig in and say, OK, now we think that this gene, um, for instance, CIRBP, might be important for limb regeneration. There's actually two versions of it. Um, and so we can separately target either one of those. And we can say, OK, if we take it away, what happens? And so these are the kinds of things we're doing now in the lab. And the next thing I'm going to show you is before you go and invest all that effort into removing that gene, you might first want to validate its expression. So shown here is a tissue section of a regenerating axolotl limb. And you can see this big, huge, meaty blastema here. And here's the wound epidermis overlying it. And so this is a gene that we identified from that kind of study. And it encodes a protein that is a secreted protein, um, which we're very keenly interested in because secreted proteins are the kinds of molecules that um, allow cells to communicate with one another. And so here we have a secreted protein that has some um, interesting features about it. And we can see that it's mRNA. So everything, all the cells that are purple here are ones that are expressing the mRNA um, for this gene. And so basically, this is a very nice validation that this gene is very highly enriched in blastema and not really expressed in the stump. And we've also looked at this in uninjured limbs and seen that we can't even detect the expression. So we think it's very peculiar to blastema cells. Um, and we've since shown that if you knock it down, so this is a technique um, that is not, not removing the gene, but just diminishing it somewhat. Um, it's sort of an in-between technique that you will do before you invest in really getting rid of the gene. But if you knock it down, at this stage of regeneration, normally you can see that there are four digits that have formed in this amount of tissue beyond the beyond the arrowheads is what's been regenerated. But without um, as much of this gene, you can see that basically we have a very immature blastema here, and it's not um, anywhere near the digit stage. And so if we look at their skeletons, this one is very nicely got all of these cartilage elements, and this one's got basically nothing. And so we know that this gene is important for helping the blastema grow. And we've since knocked it out. And we're in um, the generation now where they have zero of, of this gene and zero of this protein, and we're um, determining if it is required for limb regeneration, and if so, how. Another gene we identified this way is a completely different gene shown here um, that we call CIRBP, cold inducible RNA binding protein. And you can see here that it had a different effect when we diminished it during limb regeneration. Um, these animals still grew um, the early blastemas, but in, on the right-hand side, you can see a stain that we applied that identifies the cells that are dying. 
And um, we quantified this, which I'm not going to show you, but there's way too many cells that are dying uh, when you diminish the expression of this gene. And so from this, we know that this gene normally protects uh, blastema cells from dying. And you can just imagine that this is a very hostile environment. We also know that it has very, um, very sparse um, vascularization. So it might be hypoxic, so lacking in oxygen. Um, it's exposed to the elements. These cells actually need help surviving. And if you take away this gene, they don't. And this one also had uh, gross regenerative defects. So these are just two examples, but we're digging into many of the other things on that chart um, that I showed you earlier. So the, two, the study that I just showed you was basically getting all the mRNAs from these tissues, but grinding up the whole tissue to get the mRNA. And you can also imagine that that might be limiting insofar as there could be some genes that are really important, but only very few cells make them or express them. And if you grind the whole tissue up, you're mostly looking at the gene expression from the other cells that aren't making it. And so you can miss some things that are really important. So the way that scientists drill down now is they say, well, what are the genes expressed by individual single cells? And only in the last like five or, t five or 10 years, really, have we had the ability to ask that question. Um, have the technologies been developed to say, we're going to isolate all these individual cells, and we're going to pull the mRNA out of each one of those, and then ask the questions about like, how the gene expression differs between cells. And now this has finally been applied by our lab and one other lab um, to look at this question of what's the parts list down at the single cell level in the axolotl. So to do this work, um, basically you can take blastemas, and in this case we took the blastema and the overlying wound epidermis because we really wanted to learn more about the wound epidermis as well. And we prepared um, single cell um, suspensions of these cells, so they're all separated from one another. And what you do is you encapsulate these in a little droplet, a little oil droplet, and then inside there are all the ingredients um, to make the reaction happen that's going to tell you what the mRNAs are. And we did that also from unamputated limbs. And so performing this and then comparing the gene expression would allow us to sort of compare um, on an individual cell level how blastema cells differ from the parts list of the unamputated limb. And then we can also compare um, the gene expression in individual blastema cells from um, the individual cells from these other tissues shown here. And I don't have time to get into the things that we found here, and we're doing a lot more of this, but I wanted to show you that we've since discovered, for instance, genes that are very highly expressed in particular cells of this wound epidermis. So this gives us a handle on um, some factors in the wound epidermis that we might want to investigate further. So for instance, to see if um, you get rid of these, if you don't grow blastema, um, and to see how those are, you know, underlie the process of limb regeneration. And we had some surprises in here, as well as some, um, some cells that weren't surprises that we consider to be um, sort of the control example. And I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of cells that we were able to isolate um, in this process. And so here we see our friends, the macrophages, which we discussed earlier. So we expected to see those. But in this kind of study, we were actually able to parse out different kinds of macrophages um, that might be important. Um, to distinguish like the different kinds and what they might be doing. We also saw other kinds of immune cells, so uh, T cells, which are involved in adaptive immunity, uh, B cells also involved in adaptive immunity. Basically, nothing is known in salamanders about uh, the function of these types of cells during the limb regeneration process. Neutrophils, another type of immune cell. Um, we got uh, endothelial cells, so those are the building blocks of blood vessels. Parasites, which are support cells for blood vessels. Um, these fibroadipocyte progenitors, which we really don't know what those are doing in limb regeneration either. And there's some interesting information coming out from the uh, mouse studies about what this might be doing um, during other kinds of healing events. And then, of course, fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are one of the most well-known cell types um, that appear on the scene during limb regeneration, but it's turning out there's a lot of heterogeneity within the fibroblast population, and so there's a lot of really interesting biology to discover here. Okay, so how can we use these new technologies to crack old questions and learn more about the parts and the instructions? Um, uh, we talked earlier about this difference between proximal distal and the fact that retinoic acid can reprogram the distal ones to make a whole limb. And in this study that we did with the bulk sequencing, so not the single cell sequencing, but the bulk, we also compared distal blastemas to proximal. And you can see that here are the ones, the genes that the distal ones express a lot of, and here are the ones the proximal ones express a lot of. And this allowed us to make predictions um, that we might be able to um, sort of reprogram the distal blastemas to be more proximal and maybe grow an entire arm with overexpressing, for instance, one of these particular genes. So these studies are underway. Another thing you might wonder is, does the limb need a reference model to regenerate? So during normal limb regeneration, there is a reference model, right? It is the limb that was there before that had developed. 
Um, but this is sort of an interesting question to think about. Like, does a limb need a reference model in order to regenerate? And the best um, type of experiment that we've so far devised to look at this question has been this one, where we took the baby axolotl, and this just has the limb buds, which in some ways are similar to the blastema. So this is the original outgrowth that grows the first limb. And then to just um, remove them, and to keep removing them, and to remove them many, many times until the animal is basically an adult, and it has grown the hind limbs, but it never grew the forelimbs. And if we do this many times, then we get an animal that looks like this. And then this will allow us to ask this question, can it grow a regenerate limb, let's call it, or a limb for the first time um, at this adult stage in its life? And we had a really surprising result, which I have to say we haven't understood yet the mechanism behind this, but I think it's really interesting. And that's that in the control example, so these animals are the exact same age and from the same pedigree as the ones I'm about to show you, they have an appropriately sized limb. It looks like this, and if we amputate it, it grows back totally fine, the right size. However, there were only two outcomes in, in this experimental um, context, and these outcomes are illustrated here. In the first situation, nothing grew at all, so no limb at all, and about half of them fell into that category. And in the other situation, if they grew something, they looked outwardly 100% normal, except for they were miniaturized. So these animals grew a miniature limb, but is even, what is interesting because they've sort of decoupled the size of the body from the size of the appendage. And that strikes at a very fundamental question in biology that we don't really have um, the answer to yet, which is how does an animal, even when it's developing it the first time, scale the size of its arms um, to its whole body? However, what I think is actually more interesting about this is it's permanent, meaning if you amputate um, those miniature limbs, what happens? they grow back a miniature limb, as shown here. And so this is also connected to that, um, that sort of autonomy thing I was talking about earlier with the blastema. So the blastema from a miniaturized limb is permanently miniaturized, and it has the instructions to make a miniature limb, even though the rest of the body um, would suggest it should be growing something closer to the control size. And finally, I want to wrap the talk up by talking about this question, which I'm happy to take more questions about later, and that's um, I tell you that the animal grows this structure, right? And that the structure is made up probably of like activated progenitor cells and maybe some cells that have sort of gone back in time and become more embryological. And in many ways that resembles a, a tumor, um, like from cancer, right? And so we also know that salamanders hardly ever get tumors. Basically, like I have 3,000 in the lab and maybe five of them have an observable tumor, which would not be the case in a mouse colony. And we don't really understand the, this relationship between regeneration and, um, and tumorogenesis. But I wanted to give you um, sort of a little preview of what might be coming in future years uh, once we understand the mechanism. So this is a beautiful paper done in 1952, a single author paper, this guy, Charles Breedis. And he took and injected into newts, a different kind of salamander, but I have the axolotl here. He injected chemicals that normally cause cancer in mammals um, into this newt. And what he found was that he, this allowed him to ask this question, right? Do you get a tumor, which would be the prediction if they were going to behave the same way, or do you get something else? And he found that they very rarely get tumors, very occasionally, but very rarely do they get tumors. Instead, what happens to them? So instead of getting a tumor in response to a known carcinogen, what they got is this. And this is, they would grow an extra limb at that site. So this is crazy, right? And it's super fascinating to think that these animals will take a cue, a cellular insult that normally will lead to a tumor in a human being, and they'll interpret it in a different way. And they'll instead grow a fully patterned a new limb here. And if you were to have captured this when it was first growing out, like the little bump here, and you cut through there, it looks just like a blastema from a regenerating limb, right? And so we think this is really interesting. And there will be more work on this in the future. The only thing so far that we've done that really starts to strike at this question is that um, we have done these experiments where we basically look at the regenerating limb. And we assume that there's going to be all kinds of stress going on um, in these cells. And when cells are really stressed and when they have to replicate many times, then they have a propensity to um, un incur DNA damage, right? And so they're really would otherwise be considered to be in a state that where they might be prone to form a tumor, but they don't get a tumor. Um, and so normally what will happen is that um, there can be breaks in the DNA and you can detect this using different assays. Um, but what the salamanders do instead of getting broken DNA and tumors is that they can anticipate that this could happen and so they upregulate the factors that control uh, the response to DNA damage. And they turn on um, DNA repair parts and instructions to quench DNA damage basically before it even happens. So we would love to understand this more so it could be harnessed for regenerative medicine because this is actually a huge problem if you're growing cells um, in, the, in the lab that you want to implant in a human being is that as they 
undergo um, replication, you can um, get DNA damage. And of course, you don't want to um, put those kinds of cells into a person because they could be very dangerous. So I would say that now is the time to completely understand this instruction manual that the salamander is providing us. Um, it's giving us all the information about the tools, the parts, the environment, and the instructions on how to make a new limb. And that someday this is going to allow us to approach this question um, in the human being. Um, what would it take to regenerate a human arm or a leg? You're going to need some activated cells. You're going to need some cues for telling those cells what to do and to basically create the environment um, to get them to do that. And then you're going to need some information so that you get the exact replica because you want the perfect replica um, to form. And then finally, you want to also consider um, making sure that the environment promotes regeneration instead of scarring. And I think salamanders have a lot to offer about every single one of these questions. And finally, I want to acknowledge um, the people in my lab who have done all of the work that I showed you. I also referenced a lot of work, um, important work from other labs, um, and those people were shown on those slides. And so um, these are the members of my laboratory um, who have who work very hard to figure this out. And then, of course, I need to acknowledge our funders, as shown here, and our um, very close collaborator at the Broad Institute um, in Cambridge, Brian, who has done so much of the bioinformatics um, for these projects just because he really is fascinated by the questions also. And I will take any questions that you have. Thank you, Jessica. Who has the first one? I'll bring you the mic. Thanks, Jerry. Well, that was a Brave New World uh, lecture. Uh, uh, interesting way you use the IKEA instructions, too, to break down the tools from the parts from the instructions that get your mind set. So when the salamander regrows its limb as a young salamander, then it will continue to grow to adult size. So if you did that with a young, if you transferred it to humans mm -hmm. and did it with a young child, you'd also have to be able to make it grow into an adult limb. Yeah, you'd want to make sure it still responds to like the normal growth cues as the person ages, yeah. so that it's not like refractory in some way. Yeah. Twelve year old arm. Oh, well, so, yeah, in the opposite direction, for sure, like, especially with the legs, right? Like, there would, if it was an infant leg on an adult man, it would be basically useless, right? And even with the arm, like, you want to make it the exact right size, though it's debatable, like, a miniature, like, a two-year-old arm on an adult male, like, you know, the utility of that versus the prosthesis, right? Right, that's another way to think about it also. Um, yeah, so there's possible that there could be some interface with press prosthetic limbs in this equation. Um, but ultimately, the real goal, I think, would be to sort of um, jumpstart or kickstart the process in the human that might be latent. Yeah. We have one from one of your sons. Oh, no. He doesn't want to <laughs> ask it. <laughs> Are there any online ones? <laughs> uh, apparently, I need a mic to ask a question now. But um, what happens if you put the... Um, like back the leg from the blastema from the leg in the back onto where like the miniature um, leg would grow on some of the salamanders? So like it, what we didn't address this question in this talk, which is does the blastema from a hind limb have the information to make a hind limb, even if it's transplanted onto a forelimb? And the answer is yes. So you could like prepare the skeletons from that and see. Um, it depends, I mean, a little bit of this depends on how old the blastema is, I think. So um, once you have like the full thing, it would grow a hind limb, yes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to, wait, I'm sorry. Did, the, did your mom answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. So I want to see if I understand. If you interrupt the development of a blastema, mm -hmm. You cut off some of the information, whether mm -hmm. nerves or macrophages or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. and then you give it time. Mm -hmm. Those nerves and th they'll redevelop. Yeah. But in order to regenerate the limb, you have to amputate again. Is that right? It, this actually also depends because of, um, this sort of depends. So, like, okay, take the example of the skin. If you do the suturing right. over the full thickness, so sometimes in the lab, it's. Um, the animals break the sutures. So the sutures will break, and then it exposes what's inside, and then they'll spontaneously regrow a limb, even if it's like a couple months later, right? Okay. And so that animal still can, um, can sense that 
it's missing the limb, even though the amputation event might have been very much earlier, right? So in the experiments I showed you, people did re-amputate. Um, in the nerve example, if you just let it go without amputating, it will eventually grow in. But the, yeah, the macrophages, I think you have to re-amputate, which could talk, speak a little bit to like their exact role in the regeneration of the macrophages, maybe, you know, something, setting the stage earlier, yeah. Other, other questions or comments from anyone? I can only compare this to my own experiences with wound healing, stuff like that. And that there are times when the wound will heal and it doesn't scar. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are other times you form a scab and you get that scarring. It seems that there might be a connection in that process where you don't scar, where the skin fills in, and you technically have a pretty good looking epidermis at that time. Is your research leading to this? Is, do you think that there is something there that is going to perhaps lead to the possibility of regeneration? So I, can't, I think that some of the stuff we'll discover will help with uh, sort of um, lessen human scarring just with regular skin wounds. Like, I'm hoping that because there's basically the biological therapeutics for that are, are there's hardly any, right? Um, some people are trying mechanical ways to sort of, because mechanical tension, like across the wound, like when you suture and then basically that can set the, set the stage for getting a scar to form, right? Um, so I do think like there could turn out to be some genes and some proteins that salamanders deploy during normal limb regeneration that if we could you know, put those in a cream, it could help a person. I don't think that's crazy. I think that maybe that will happen. But I think your question was more the opposite, which is sort of like, could we understand something about in the cases where the human scar isn't so bad, if those are linked to regeneration, something like that. Um, yeah, I think that that's definitely the, possible. So one thing we didn't get into is that there are, um, these sort of culprit cells are one of the main culprits in forming a scar and a skin wound is something called a myofibroblast. And so this is like a transformed fibroblast. So they're fibroblasts all over in your skin and underneath your skin and stuff. But like normally they're not cranking out these naughty chemicals that tell um, other cells that, that form like the scar, right? The bundles of collagen and stuff. And so it's possible that um, the balance is shifted. Like in humans, we get too many of these cells and in salamanders, they have a way of putting the brakes on them. And so, you know, if we understood in the human, the difference between um, when you get a bad scar and when you don't, and some people are sort of dissecting the different kind of fibroblasts apart because they're not all the same, right? Some of them are pro-scarring and some of them are anti-scarring. And these kinds of single cell technologies and other kinds of sorting technologies have enabled us to ask the question of how fibroblasts are different from one another. And it turns out that some of them are bad and some of them are good. And that if you can dial down the bad ones um, and inc therefore increase the fraction of the good ones that you, you get less scarring. And this has been shown now in mice from other labs. And so I think that it will be interesting to see how that plays out in the salamander if the same thing breaks down or not. Yeah. I don't think, that's, I don't think that anti-scarring therapies in humans are forever off. I, I think we're going to see them. Yeah. Biological. We have therapy. one in the back. Yeah. So uh, I'm thinking about plants. And in plants, we have a lot of the similar situation. You can control the environment. Plants re regenerate things. Is there any connection, because plants are so much simpler, of studying some of the things that happen on plants versus animals? So I think that the similarities and differences between plants and animals on, with respect to regeneration are very understudied um, in general. But I, but I think that some of the things going on in plants are likely to be overlapping. So you know, for instance, plants have systemic injury responses, um, which is they're not the same. The molecules aren't the same, but the thought process could be the same. Um, we didn't touch on this idea of bioelectricity or like how cells are communicating with ions to one another, but. Um, one of our collaborators is actually a plant biologist, and he's looking at that in plants, and it's turning out that there's some, some overlap between there. In plants, they have this, uh, people have recently appreciated that they can replace like the stem cells in the stem cell niche um, if it's ablated. And so like, that is thought to be an instance of a de-differentiation event like we were kind of talking about. And so like some of the mechanisms, I think, may be overlapping, even if the exact cell types and the exact molecules are not the same. I definitely think that's the case. Some of the, some of the principles, underlying principles, could be the same. Yeah. The systems are so much simpler. 
Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I was just wondering about the choice of the axolotl salamander for all of these projects. Uh -huh. Is it um, just because they're commercially available in the pet trade, or are they much better regenerators than a lot of other right. salamanders? Um, so most of the more the older work, a lot of it was done in newts. So newts are another kind of salamander, and they're like uh, this evolutionary distance between them and axolotls is vast. It's like 150 million years or something. Don't quote me on that, but I think it's close. Um, and um, all of those newts were captured in the wild um, because they're notoriously difficult to breed in the lab. And that's because they have a seven year generation time. So once you start talking about doing real genetics, you want to ha have uh, the, the animals that you've like messed with one of the genes, but then you want to breed them out and then breed them out. So basically since they have two copies, right? And so it's prohibitive almost in the newt to get to the true mutants, which are the ones completely lacking the gene. Um, and so that's why many people have turned to the axolotl, right? The generation time is still really long. It's a year. For an experimental model system, that is crazy long. Um, but it's much more manageable than seven years. However, there's like important comparisons to be made and, and co contrast to be made between the axolotl and the newt. So it's not as if no one's working on newt anymore. And in fact, now there are some other popular types of salamanders, including um, different kinds of newts that have a shorter generation time, like one and a half years, um, that people are using. Um, in these kinds of genetic studies. And so I think there's value in, in, in doing the experiments in many different kinds of salamanders because they're actually quite diverse. And to see you know, what are the common and different mechanisms between them, which should give us some insights on like, the different ways you could approach the problem in, in the mammal, right? But yeah, this is sort of a practical reason um, for the axolotl, yeah. Jessica, thank you for a fascinating lecture. You've given us lots to think about and we appreciate it very much. All right, thanks for having me.